Good morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving weekend. How many of you, show of hands, have already had your turkey dinner? Some of you have already had it. So you're having like turkey muffins and turkey stew and turkey pancakes and all of that stuff for the leftovers. I I love Thanksgiving meals, but I got to admit, it's the leftovers that I love. Just picking at all the food in the fridge for the next week after Thanksgiving. It's so great. Um, It's also great to have our KidZone kids that are in the service with us today. So kids, when you came in today, you should have gotten one of these bags. If you managed to sneak past Regina without grabbing one of these. She's in the back. She can like throw one to you exactly where you're sitting because I know that's how we like to get all the kids fired up before I start preaching. And if you take a peek in here, I already looked. I didn't, there was no chocolate. So, you know, but you know, if you go through here and there's activities and there's like the verse of the day that you have to unscramble, if you can put that all together, then Regina's got a surprise for you after the service. So put that together if you find me really, really boring, that's okay. So does everybody else. All right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There we go. So what we're going to do today is we're continuing our sermon series in the book of Acts. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open that up. And we're going to be reading from a very difficult passage today. And it's difficult not because of how hard it is to unpack theologically, which means kind of the whole God and God working in humanity and trying to get deep into the richness of the text. It's a difficult text because we have to ask ourselves a really hard question. And the hard question is, what does this text mean for my life? I was just reflecting on all the things to be thankful for since it's Thanksgiving weekend. And one of the things that I'm incredibly thankful for is you. I'm so thankful to be a part of this church family. I'm so thankful for how you serve, how you give, and how you actually want to live lives where you're seeking out the Lord so that the, so that the creator of the heavens and earth can transform how you live your life. I mean, just last week, something I was so incredibly thankful for, we had a volunteer who was serving in our hospitality ministry last week named Nat, and it was her first Sunday serving in that area of ministry, and um, my wife oversees that area of ministry, and she wanted to just thank Nat for the great job that she was doing, and she was running up to catch her because Nat had her jacket, and it looked like she was getting ready to run out the door. So Danielle goes running after her to catch her, to thank her for her service, (laughs) and it wasn't even her coat. She had grabbed a coat to give to one of our senior ladies to help her put her coat on so that she could leave. That's one of the things I just love so much about this church is that we seek God together as a family to see how God wants to change our lives so that we can be a blessing to the people around us. See, church was never created so that you could just attend it for what you get from it. And I think that's the biggest challenge of the Western church today is we are so obsessed on what I get from ministry. Whereas scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture teaches us how are you and I willing to die for the sake of the world? (laughs) To lay down our wants, our desires, our plans, and to seek first God's kingdom. Because Jesus says, if you do that, all of our other desires and wants and needs will be taken care of. But when we live the way the world lives of just pursuing what we want, it doesn't have a very big impact in our lives or in the lives of people around us. So as we dive into today's text, I want us to be thinking about how this impacts how you and I live. I want to just, again, because you're all wearing masks, and so it's hard to know if you're paying attention or not, and because I can't see those of you that are joining us online today, because I'm not in the chat with you, just kind of show of hands, I want you to raise your hands if this connects with you. I want you to think for a moment as an example, um, how does it feel when you catch someone lying to you? 
How many of you show a hand when you find out someone has lied to you, you feel great about it? Like you're so happy and you're like, wow, that was a really good lie. I'm so impressed that you got away with that. Like that, man, that's a good one. I should write that one down so I could use that one at work one day or I could use that one on another, on one of my teachers or on my parents or something. Okay, there are no hands going up. I don't know, Danielle, if there's any hands going up in the chat. <laughs> How many of you, when you find out someone's lied to you, it hurts? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah, it hurts. It's disappointing. You feel betrayed. It erodes trust. See, lying has a way of really breaking the relationships that we have with people. And what about the flip side? How do you feel when you've gotten away with lying to people? How many of you feel amazing? I know mean, no one's going to raise their hand on this one, okay? Even if you do feel amazing that you got away with it. No one's going to confess that with everybody looking this morning, and definitely no one's going to confess that publicly on the chat. It's like, yeah, I lied to my wife today, and man, she bought it hook, line, and sinker, and yes, awesome, I feel great, <laughs> Okay. If you do feel that way, come and book an appointment with me, pastoral care. You can email me, kevin at greenbelt.church, because that ain't healthy. <laughs> There's something wrong with us, especially as followers of Jesus, if we feel so great that we've gotten away with our lies. See, when we get caught lying, again, we feel guilt, we feel dishonest, we feel shame, and it breaks relationships. And this is the text that I want us to talk about today. How you and I live our lives impacts the relationships around us. When I was a, a brand new Christian, um, I started attending a men's Bible, uh, Bible study group in my church in Montreal. And I started attending this group because I was desperate um, for Christian men to help mentor me and guide me because I became a Christian as a young adult. I became a Christian right before getting married. I became a Christian right before having kids. I didn't grow up in this environment of youth group and kids ministry and young adults ministry and Sunday morning worship and all of this stuff. It was all completely foreign to me. But I knew following Jesus had to make a difference. It, it had to make a difference in my career. It has to make a difference in my marriage. It has to make a difference as a father. <clears throat> so I found this guy who was a little bit older than me, might have been about 20 years older than me. His name was Danny. And, and I just started hanging out and having coffee with Danny. And Danny said some very powerful words to me. Where he said, Kevin, it doesn't matter what you teach your children. You could teach your children all of this. Sound doctrine, good theology, good ideology, good methodologies in the church. Oh, these are all big fancy words. I'm just showing off my education for a quick moment, okay? Show that it was worth all the money. These are just ways of describing the academic side of the Christian faith. Now, all of those things are good things, I'm a huge believer in the importance of good theology and sound doctrine. But he said, Kevin, you can teach your kids all of this. And all that is going to matter is how they see you live your life. If this doesn't change how you live, you're not going to fool anybody. Especially our children. <laughs> They're watching us. Kids are the ultimate Christian accountability program that God has ever created. <laughs> you don't need a, a Christian, you don't need a mentorship program, you don't need to read a book on this. Your children are the greatest Christian accountability program that God has ever created. Because how you and I live our lives matters. It matters to the people around us. It matters to God. So again, we're continuing this sermon series, Church on the Go. We're going through the book of Acts. You know, and the book of Acts shows us the early life of the Christian church. It shows us what it means to be followers of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go. See, Jesus gave these words in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said to his followers, he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And just as a way to quickly summarize the series that we've done so far in the last three weeks, we talked on week one, how you have the power to go and make disciples. As a follower of Jesus, who's put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sin, the Holy Spirit comes on you. The same power that is empowering these believers in the book of Acts is the exact same power that compels you to go and make disciples. We talked about the importance of fellowship, of being in a meaningful relationship with people who believe like we believe, to open up our lives to one another. So that, and we saw how fellowship is worth the risk in order to save the loss. And then last week, we talked about how God gives us the power and the words to go. That your personal story, your testimony, what God has done in your life is a powerful story to bless the world. And so today we're going to continue in Acts chapter 5. And again, it's a difficult passage. And it's difficult because what we tend to do is get lost in the details of this story. Have you, any of you, you've ever heard the expression, the devil is in the details? Show of hands, so you, you know that, put in the chat, yep, I know that expression. See, the reason we have that expression, it's because it's details that splits churches. <laughs> you ever realize that? It's in the details where we're suddenly, we, we get mad at one another. It's in the details where we go, yeah, I can't fellowship with her, or I'm not going to fellowship with him. It's in the details, we get a little obsessive, and we get a little nitpicking. And this is one of these stories that we could get lost and we could get derailed in the details. Well, why did God do this? And why did God do this? And why did God do this? And we could argue, argue, argue over why God did this. But the point of the story is not so much about why God did this. The point of the story is how do you and I respond to what God has done? Again, I'm 50 years old. I've been following Jesus now for over 22 years. I'm starting to get to the point where I'm not overly concerned with why God does what he does. Because he's God and I'm not. <laughs> I'm starting to get more and more to the point where it's like, okay, God, I don't understand why. But what do I do with this? How should I respond? And how can I be a blessing in response to what you're doing? For me, that is the heart of this text. So let's look at this here together. Okay, just to summarize a little bit of where we're at here in the book of Acts. Um, what starts happening in Acts chapter 4 is something really weird starts to happen. And it's something that is incredibly countercultural to our Western civilization. It's people, the Christians, empowered by the Spirit of God, develop such a heart for one another, develop such a heart to care for the widows and for the orphans and for the poor, to care for everyone that the Bible categorizes as the least of these. These are the people that the Jewish leaders ignored, that the Jewish elite wanted nothing to do with. And the heart of the church was so so deeply touched for these people is people began to sell their possessions and give the money away. Selling their home, selling their big home and downgrading into a smaller home so that they could bless other people with that money of, you know, pooling all of their money and their resources together so that all could be blessed such a radically different way to live. And I'm not suggesting everyone go and put your house on the market today or anything like that. That's not the point of the text. But what you see is this heart happening. They're so passionate to care for one another, to see people well, to see people cared for, taken care of. And so that's where Acts chapter four goes. And then that's what leads directly into Acts chapter five. I'm going to start reading here in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And here it says, in verse 1, it says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, 
also sold a piece of property. So just like what the other Christians were doing, they're selling their homes, they're selling their possessions, they're selling their properties, and they're bringing that money to the apostles so the apostles can distribute the money, the deacons that they're assigning in here that could all assign, you know, help out the people who needed the help and the care and the support. And then it continues in verse 2. It says, with the wife's full knowledge, he, being Ananias, he kept, pa- he kept back part of the money for himself. But he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. And then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Remember that feeling? <laughs> that we talked about when someone lies to you? How do you feel in that moment? When someone you love, someone you care about, someone that you're doing life with lies to you, how does that make you feel? Suddenly we're seeing God responding in that same kind of way. How could you lie to God? And Peter continues, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So what, makes, what made you think of doing such a thing? Right? You've not just lied to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. And a great fear seized all who heard what happened. And then some young men came forward, wrapped, him up, wrapped up his body, carried him out to be buried. And about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing that this had happened. And Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? She goes, yes. She said, that's the price. And so Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the Holy Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out also. And at this moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young men came in, finding her dead. They carried her out, and they buried her beside her husband. And then great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You see, this is where we get lost in the details. Well, why did God do this? I thought God was loving and I thought God was merciful and I I thought God was fair. This this story doesn't sound fair. This story doesn't sound very loving. Right? And we can spin and spin and spin and spin and put all the blame on God, all the questions on God, all uh, the accusations on God, and forget this isn't a story about God, this part here. This is in here so that you and I could look at our lives. How are you and I living our lives? Right? This isn't some story to use as Christian moralism, so you better do what your parents say or the Lord's going to be angry at you. No, (laughs) it's not the point. It's not a point to manipulate people. It's not a a story to make our children, our our teenagers, our young adults who live under our roof obey me or else. (laughs) It's not that kind of story. It's a story of the fact that God wants to deal with our sin in the church. (laughs) And that's the big idea that I want us to explore together for the rest of our time is this. God wants to deal with our sin as the church so we can go. God wants to deal with our sin as the church so that we can go. Now, remember the word sin, this is just a a, a fancy word that means any thought or any action which is different from the way God wants us to live. That's what sin is. It's any thought, it's any action, which is different than the way God calls his children. God calls humanity to live their lives. And when we live those ways, when we think those ways, when we behave those ways, when we act out of those ways, that's what the Bible calls sin. And yes, God is loving. And yes, God wants to bless. And God wants the church to grow, to be healthy, to create a loving environment. God wants to see people set free from their sin, to overcome the power of sin in our lives so that as God blesses you with dealing with the sin in your life, just like how God deals with the sin in my life, 
Suddenly, when God starts blessing in those areas, you become equipped to go and bless other people in the world. So God is very concerned with the sin in the church. If you ever do a detailed study of the New Testament, you will see that almost every commandment about sin in the New Testament is directed to the church. Again and again and again and again and again, the writers of the New Testament are way more concerned with the behavior and the sin in the church, way more concerned about that than the sin outside of the church. Because God is creating a new family. God is creating a new, what the Bible calls a new humanity. A group of men, women, boys, and girls who look different than the rest of the world. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're supposed to be different because of the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So God wants to deal with our sin. God wants to deal with my sin. So what do a couple of things that we can see from this text? Just two points today. So I want to look at these things here and talk about these. He sold it. He could have done anything with the money. There was no expectation on anybody. It's like, thou shalt better give 79.6% of your property sale to the church. There's nothing like that here. Everyone's living out this freedom that they have in Christ of figuring out what this new church thing is. So it was all Ananias' and Sapphira's, you know, property and money to do with whatever God put on their heart to do. But then Peter says these words when he gets busted in this lie. He says, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? This is the same Peter that Jesus had to say almost exact same words to. See, when Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to go, that Jesus was going to go to the cross, that he was going to die, and Peter said, no way, no how, it's not going to happen. And Jesus has to go to Peter and say, uh, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you see, our spiritual enemy has this way of creeping into the church, <laughs> of making it so that we get so obsessed on details, that we don't like certain people, we don't like what certain people are doing, how certain people are living, how certain people believe, all of these things. Or we just kind of love our own secret sin. We love kind of these things that keep us far from God. We love those things more than we love God, right? And our hearts can be fooled. I remember a mentor of mine put it this way, talking about sin. He said, sin is like a good sneeze. It feels great coming out, but then there's snot everywhere. (laughs) It feels, sin feels great in the moment. And then you got to deal with the mess of it afterwards, (laughs) right? And we get deceived, That somehow the world we live in, spiritual influence of this world, it makes us think that this sin is better than what God has for us. And God wants to deal with that because it's a lie that this sin is better than what God has in store for us. Jesus said these words in John chapter 10, verse 10. He says, the thief, talking about Satan, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy but I've come that you may have life and have life to the full. You see, the call of the church is to guard our hearts. It's to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit living in each and every one of us to guard our hearts so that you and I will not be deceived by the lies of the world. And the Bible talks again and again and again about how you and I are to guard our hearts. There's a great passage in Ephesians chapter 6 that talks about this. We can read about this in verse 11. It says, you know, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. The devil just wants us to believe lies. 
wants us to believe that no one, this sin's not going to bother anyone. It's not going to hurt anyone. It doesn't matter. But it does matter. Because how you and I live our lives matters. It matters greatly to our families. It matters greatly in our places of work. It matters greatly in our schools. It matters greatly in our churches, how we live our lives. So we need to guard our hearts against the devil's schemes. So it talks about this armor of God that we need to put on. Right? And we can read about that again. If you want to see the details of it, you can read about this in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 13. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. See, God wants us to guard our hearts against this spiritual influence in the world. <laughs> That's the first thing that God wants to deal with. He wants to deal with that spiritual influence that can attack our hearts. And then the other thing that we need to deal with, I believe, as followers of Jesus, is we need to deal with making God's, um, prioritizing God's fame over our own fame. We need to deal with God's fame over our own fame. See, again, Ananias and Sapphira, what this story is showing us is um, a spiritual pride that can easily trickle into any person. It can trickle into me. It can trickle into our elders. It can trickle into our small group leaders, our kid zone leaders, our fusion leaders, and it can trickle into any heart of anyone who's joining us online or sitting here in the room. <laughs> See, spiritual pride is kind of at the heart of most religions, <laughs> of how holy I am, of how great I am, of look at how I live my life in comparison to other people around me. We see this again and again and again in the New Testament where Jesus had his harshest words to people with spiritual pride, <laughs> There's a parable where Jesus talks about this, this Jewish leader, this Pharisee, who teaches the commands of God, who should have the biggest heart for poor people, should have the biggest heart for sinners, because that's the heart of God. God's heart is for the lost and for the broken and for the marginalized. And the people who know the Bible the best should, have, should be reflecting God's heart the most. And this Pharisee prays prayers like, thank you, Lord, for not making me like that sinner over there. See, that's spiritual pride, where you and I become more concerned with what people think about us, how smart I am, how good my theology is, my view on world events, all of these things. Look how smart I am, instead of making God famous, putting God's fame first. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, the author of Hebrews is talking about kind of our spiritual heritage as followers of Jesus. And he talks about Moses. There's one little verse in here about Moses. Now, Moses was born into a slave family in Egypt. And they were killing all the firstborn sons. And so the mom wanted this little baby to survive. And so she put the baby in a basket so Moses could go down the river. And he's found by the, by the princess of Egypt. And he can live like a king. He has all the blessings of the world available to him. And Hebrews reminds us this about Moses. It says he, being Moses, chose, chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. <laughs> he chose a position of slavery. He chose a position of sacrifice. He chose to lower himself for God's fame over all the blessings of the world. So that's the posture of the church because God wants to deal with our sin so that we can go. You see, that's why we come to church. <laughs> like, think about it. Why do we do this thing? 
Like, why do we gather together on a Sunday morning, whether in, in the building like this or whether it's online? Why, why do we do this? <laughs> yes, it's because we want to bring praises and glory to God. <laughs> But the ultimate purpose of the gathering of the saints, the gathering of the people of God, whether it's in person or whether it's online, I believe they're both biblical. The purpose is to sharpen one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to spur one another on to deal with our sin. Because the more you and I in this loving environment where we can be real with one another, where we don't have to be worried about what people think about us. We can let our guards down because no one, guess what? Here at Greenbelt Church, no one's perfect. Nobody. We all stink at something. All of us. And that's an awesome position to be in (laughs) because it just takes away that spiritual pride. And we can be real before one another so that we can deal with our sin. Because how we live matters. People are watching. When this text here in Acts chapter 5 says this fear gripped the entire church, it wasn't this fear like, oh no, God hates me. It's not that kind of a fear. It's this reverence in God's power. And this reverence of like, wow, God really cares about what's going on here. God takes church really seriously. So maybe you and I, we should take church really seriously too. I heard a pastor say this once. He said this on a Christmas Eve service, and I've I've never had the guts to do this because I'm just afraid of the emails that would come in that Monday. (laughs) And he said in a Christmas Eve service, when it's filled, most Christmas Eve services or Easter Sunday services have a lot of non-Christians that will attend it. And he said on Christmas Eve, he said, either the birth of Jesus is the most important thing to humanity that's ever happened, or it's not. It's one or the other. It can't be both. So you need to choose. It's either a complete waste of time. Don't commit a moment to it. Or it's the most important single event in human history that humanity can be made right with God. So you should dedicate your entire life to it because it's worth it. And when I heard him say that, it's like on Christmas Eve, it's like, oh my goodness. But he's right. <laughs> and that's what this text reminds me of today. That the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit coming into your life to forgive you of your sin, you need to treat it like it is the most important thing that's ever happened to you and then see what God does. <laughs> And maybe for some of you today, it's starting with just giving your life to Jesus. Maybe some of you that are joining us, whether here in person or online, for you, it's finally, I've been dancing around this topic for a long time. I know who Jesus is. I know what he's done. I've heard the stories. But today, it's time to say, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. Come into my life and make me new. And if you do that today, God promises that the Holy Spirit comes on you and makes you new. Your sins are wiped away. You're clean. And that you can now step into that power that God gives you right now to be a part of his family and to deal with the sin in your life. So if you pray that prayer online, a pop-up shows up, please click that pop-up to let us know that you've done that. We'd love to celebrate with you. If you've done that here in person, come and tell me after the service. I'd love to rejoice with you this morning because this is what God wants to do. He wants to deal with our sin. He wants to deal with our sin. So how can we do that more? If you've put your faith in Jesus, whether today or decades ago, we need to guard our hearts. God wants to deal with my sin so I can go. God wants to deal with your sin, so you can go. So let's do that together. Study Ephesians chapter 6. Look at it with your life group this week. There's some great advice on how you and I can guard our hearts 
in Ephesians chapter 6, so that we cannot be worried about the schemes of the devil who's trying to kill and steal and destroy our, our spiritual lives. Things like prayer, things like reading the Bible, asking a Christian friend for advice, right? How can I lower myself in such a way that I'm not so concerned with how many people follow me on social media and all the likes and all the influence I can have, but how can I make Jesus more famous in my life? Maybe it's to do something this week, to be thankful for someone in your life. Do something kind to someone without any hopes of reward. <laughs> Maybe it's kids, clean your room without mom or dad asking. <laughs> it can be so simple. Little things like that can guard our hearts. Brag about how good God is in your life. Because God wants all of us as a family, to love one another well, to deal with the sin that we have in the church. We're not fooling anybody. It's there. It's real. And we deal with it in love so that we can trust in the power of God to go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you. I thank you for this reminder in this text that how I live my life matters to you. And how I live my life matters so much that you, uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, remind me of my sin and convict me of my sin. And not to shame me, not to beat me up, not to make me feel bad, but to remind me that your power is available to deal with sin. So Holy Spirit, I ask, even, this, even in this moment, God, that you would just deal with my sin personally. <laughs> that pride that can creep in, <laughs> that wanting to be recognized, that wanting to be congratulated, all of these little sins that can creep into my heart, God, forgive me of that. And for all of us here today, Lord, in person and online, God, we praise you that you are a God who loves us so much that you actually want to change us because <laughs> you want us to be blessed by your presence in our lives. But even more important than that, then you want to use us to bless other people around us. As we deal with our sin as parents, then God, you bless our children. God, when you deal with our sin as grandparents, then you bless our grandchildren. God, when you deal with our sin as students, you bless other students around us. God, when you bless us, you know, you know, deal with our sin in our sports groups, in our hobby groups, wherever you send us, God, then you use us to bless the people in those groups. So, Father, use us today for your glory, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen.